Okay, Paul, when do you think, are we ready to go? Or maybe uh, one short introduction uh, on the meeting. So uh, we started the meeting last year, uh, as you know, it was the first version of the causal data science meeting. This is the second one. And uh, yeah, we are really excited to see how it is growing. So it once was an idea to start a 20, 30 people workshop. And now we had at the peaks, uh, 1,300 registrations. So um, yeah, really on a journey. Uh, also, thanks to you, Guido. And um, yeah, so with the causal data science meeting, we want to advance the connection between academia and industry. So um, to have more conversation, to help each other and to advance the research, but also practical frontiers. And uh, we from our, our side try to do that um, by working in research projects with colleagues, by providing workshops um, with academics and industry, um, but also um, by offering soon like a little free tool for practitioners so called the data science canvas. So we are going step by step um, and try to make our little contribution with the meeting. Um, but for now, uh, we are extremely uh, excited to welcome you, our special guest. Um, you have been a professor um, of economics at Stanford University since 2012. You earned your PhD from Brown University in 1991 and uh, longer served as the editor of Econometrica since 2019 uh, already. <clears throat> in 2021, you were co-awarded the, now I need to get this right, Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for your methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships uh, jointly with Joshua Engrist and David Card. Um, by, by coincidence, we are, you were born just one hour drive from Maastricht, one of the co-hosts here of the data science meeting. You were born in Geldrop, Netherlands. And yeah, I think with that being said, we are very thankful for you for taking your precious time to join us and the stage is yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, to, you guys can hear me okay? Uh, so I'm um, very glad to be here. Um, it's, it's obviously been a, a very busy month, uh, the last month, but it's, uh, it's very nice to actually be back to doing uh, presentations and back, back to doing uh, work. And so the, the, the theme of this paper actually fits in very well Kind of with what you were describing, kind of the the, the whole the conference is about. Then I want to talk about uh, some aspects of synthetic control methods, uh, and that's kind of a very interesting area in the way the applications have been far outpacing uh, theoretical work. Kind of in uh, in academics, it started kind of with Alberto Abadi's work in. Uh, 2003, kind of where he, he tried to estimate the causal effect of uh, terrorism in the Basque country. And then he wrote some more papers in uh, 2010 and, and 16. But there hasn't really been a huge amount of uh, the theoretical statistics and econometrics uh, work on this. But in industry, there's a huge number uh, of applications of, uh, of these, these methods. There's lots of cases where this is a very natural set of, uh, of methods to use. And, and as a result, people are kind of are really using these, uh, these things very widely, even though that doesn't necessarily show up in uh, a lot of the academic uh, work. And so here, and I, I should actually say, this is uh, joint work with uh, two students of uh, mine at Stanford, Dia Botmar and Jan Spies, and uh, Meryl Warnick, and a colleague of mine uh, at Stanford, Jan Spies. Actually, Leia Botma was a student in Maastricht uh, before she started the graduate program here at, uh, at Stanford. But so uh, here we're going to look at a particular aspect of, uh, of synthetic control methods and relating it to randomized experiments and to see what synthetic control methods uh, have to, uh, to offer there. So um, here's an outline I want to just give some uh, general comments, um, make some general comments, kind of show where this is going. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the synthetic control methods uh, in general, the way these were introduced into the econometric literature by Alberto Abadi, uh, Diamond and uh, Heinmuller. Then I'll talk about uh, the design aspect of, uh, of the paper we look at what the properties are of uh, synthetic control methods. 
if you actually have random assignment of, uh, of units to the treatment, uh, and we'll see that the properties there are not necessarily as, uh, as attractive as you might uh, think. But then we show that by, modif by uh, minor modification of the synthetic control estimator, you can get back to some of the attractive properties of, uh, uh, of the difference in means estimator and the random assignment. And we show that uh, in the end, this gives us an estimator that in arguably realistic settings is going to do much better than the simple difference in, uh, in means estimator. And so, um, you know, as I sort of said at the, the very beginning, uh, the um, synthetic control methods have, have become uh, very widely used in, uh, in recent uh, years, kind of very quickly after their, their introduction, really. And they're often used in a setting where we have a relatively small number of units. Uh, um, with, um, we, have, we observe both pre and post treatment outcomes uh, for, uh, for these units. And often there's only one or a single on, or a very small number of, uh, of treated units. So one of the earliest application was where Abadi was uh, interested in estimating the effect of terrorism on the Basque country. And so he had a one region in Spain, the Basque country, that had, uh, had been exposed to terrorism. And he had a bunch of uh, regions in Spain that were not exposed to uh, terrorism, at least not to the same degree. He was trying to estimate what the causal effect of that was on the Basque uh, economy using data on uh, GDP, both before and after the uh, terrorism and uh, the information on other characteristics of these uh, regions in Spain. Another canonical example is, uh, uh, is a paper by Abadi Diamond and Heimler where they look at the effect of some anti-smoking legislation in California and they have data on uh, smoking rates both before and after the regulation in, in California as well as for all the other states in the, the United States. And kind of the third canonical example, uh, also in a paper by uh, Abadi, Diamond, and Heimmuller, they're interested in estimating the effect of the German reunification on the West German GDP. So the question is, had East and West Germany not uh, gone back together, what would have been the West German GDP relative to what it is uh, now given the reunification. And so they have data on uh, West German GDP both before and after the reuni reunification, as well as uh, data on GDP, on per capita GDP for a bunch of other OECD countries. So all these cases, all these examples, there's a relatively small number of uh, units. There's only one treated unit and there's a number a modest number of uh, pre and post uh, treatment uh, periods. And so um, these have all, these, all these examples are, are observational studies. There was no randomization. The question is uh, what we want to talk about, uh, what I want to talk about today is whether synthetic control methods have a role to play when we actually do randomize experiments. Uh, I'm going to look at the properties of the synthetic control, of the standard synthetic control estimator. I want to see if we can uh, maintain the guarantees that the conventional estimator on the randomization uh, enjoys. And ultimately, better when we do randomize experiments, whether we should still look at the synthetic control estimators, even though they were intended for, when it, in the, they were developed for observational uh, studies. And so the, the uh, I want to give a preview of, uh, of some of the results here. It turns out that randomization doesn't really validate synthetic control methods. In, in general, the standard synthetic control estimate is biased, even if we have uh, complete randomization, kind of random selection of the unit, as well as random selection of the time periods. Uh, and it's obviously very rare to actually have both. But even in that, what is arguably the most favorable case, in general, the synthetic control estimator is biased, and it can be substantially biased. Uh, but uh, we can modify it. We can ensure 
that it's unbiased under randomization by imposing a, a particular restriction on the synthetic control weights. And that gives us an estimator that is, that is like the difference in means, that is unbiased under randomization. And we can do inference uh, for that estimator. We can uh, characterize the variance and we, uh, we have an unbiased estimator for that variance. That unbiased estimator is, is kind of a little funny in the sense that it's not guaranteed to be non-negative, uh, but in practice that turns out not to be much of a problem. And this, there is some uh, sense in which it's not possible to get an unbiased estimator without allowing for the possibility that you get, get a negative variance. But on the positive side, it turns out in realistic settings, the root mean squared error for the for this modified synthetic control estimator is much better than for the for the difference in uh, in means estimator. And kind of to to illustrate that, uh, and now I'm going to give us essentially what is the the bottom line of the of the talk. Here we do a, a artificial experiment. We look at a setting where the units are the, the 50 states. We have data for 40 years uh, and the outcome is the average log weights by state and, uh, and year for these 50 states in the United States and for 40 years uh, up to about 2020. And what we do then in the simulation exercise is we repeatedly pick one unit at random from these uh, from these 50 states, we pretend it's being treated in the final period. We use either this, this synthetic control estimator or the difference in means or proposed modified uh, synthetic control estimator. We take one of these estimators, estimate the effect of the treatment. We know there was no actual treatment, so the true treatment effect is zero. We compare estimated to zero, we square the, the error every, and average that over all the 50 states. And if we do that, the difference in means estimator is by design uh, exactly unbiased, and it has a root mean squared error of, uh, of 0 0.105. The synthetic control estimator has a slight bias in this case, uh, and kind of the nature of the bias depends on, on the data. In fact, it, it's possible, depending on the data, that the bias is much bigger. But in general, it's not unbiased under this uh, randomization. But its root mean squared error is actually quite a bit smaller than, uh, than that of the difference in means estimated. It's about half that. Uh, so we, we clearly do much better using the synthetic control estimator, but we don't necessarily have guarantees there. But then we can... Uh, modify that synthetic control estimator, and I'll, I'll show later exactly what, what we do there. But if we use that modified synthetic control estimator, uh, we get an estimator exactly zero. Can you still hear me? Because there's... Yeah, we can hear you, but your yes. video is gone. My video is gone. OK, let me... Uh... Um, I think that was when I was writing on the screen here. So we, this pro, the proposed estimator has, exact, has a bias that is exactly zero, but it still maintains the improvement over the difference in means with a root mean squared error of 0.048. Again, about less than half what the difference in means estimator is. And so uh, what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is kind of uh, talk more in more generality about synthetic control estimators, where the bias is coming from, and uh, what the properties are and the randomization, and then introduce this modification that ensures unbiasedness under the randomization distribution, uh, but that in many cases does much better in root mean squared error, uh, in a root mean squared error sense than the, the difference in means. Uh, so let me 
now kind of step back a bit and uh, kind of look at the, the general setup uh, here. So I'm going to look at a case where we observe for the n units and t time periods some outcome by it uh, indexed by the, the units and the, the time periods. And in some, uh, in some in the time period, some units are being treated. I'm mainly going to focus on the case where that's just a single unit uh, in a single period. And often in practice, that's that's the last period. The units move into the treatment, but don't don't move back out. But in general, it can be. Uh, I'm going to look at the case where there's a single pair that is being treated. So there's a single element of this n by t matrix W that is equal to one and all the other elements are going to be uh, equal to zero. And that allows us kind of to simplify some of the things. But we have in the paper, we have some results for, for more general cases, but a lot of the, the intuition and the insight is coming from looking at this uh, case where there's just a single the treated uh, unit time period uh, you know, pair. And so the rows, of uh, y and w are going to correspond to the units. And so in the, the example that I'm going to use, that's the 50 states of the, the US and the columns are going to correspond uh, to time periods. Uh, and so that's years in that example. But the, these applications are often characterized by both N and T being relatively uh, modest. These are not big data settings. Though the observations themselves may be averages uh, for example, in the smoking case, so in the, the application here, it's average log wages. So it could actually be based on a large number of units. But in, in the end, when we apply these methods, both N and T are relatively modest, and that's going to, to matter. Moreover, N and T are often approximately the same size. And so that's going to also affect our ability to use particular methods uh, if we try to predict conditional expectations of outcomes in the last period, given the past, we, we're going to be doing this in a setting where the number of, of observations and the number of predictors is uh, of a similar magnitude. Uh, and so we're going to new, need to worry about uh, regularization. So thinking of this in terms of uh, potential outcomes, I'm going to assume that there's no uh, interaction between the, the units, uh, whether a particular unit gets treated, doesn't uh, affect outcomes for other units. And there's also no dynamic effects. So only the period during which a unit is treated, uh, is there a causal effect of, uh, of the treatment? Both those assumptions are obviously very, uh, very strong and not very realistic. Uh, uh, the things you can do in uh, in both cases, but uh, the insights I'm going to talk about uh, today are not changed by having those complications, but they're harder to uh, to see. But again, in kind of if you think about the bus country example, clearly the terrorism in the bus country also affected things in other parts of Spain when the. Uh, the German reunification happened that had effects on other countries. Uh, we're going to ignore those these here, and we're going to make such type assumptions that other units are not affected by these, these treatments. Moreover, we're going to assume that the effects are not dynamic, that they don't last multiple periods. Because in most cases, the treatment happens in the last period, and, um, allowing for dynamic effects is just going to change the interpretation of the results. It's not really going to change what you actually do. But for some of the insights I want to talk about, it's important that we allow for the possibility that the treatment happens in earlier periods. And uh, to discuss that, it's easier to look at the case first, where there's no dynamic effects. But kind of this is a very active literature, and there's a lot of work going on looking at more complicated settings, including allowing for dynamic effects. And in practice, in many cases, that's very important. Not in all cases, in many, in, there are a lot of cases where the effects really are 
just contemporaneous and have no dynamic uh, component. And so that's what I'm, I'm going to focus on here. So given these, these two major caveats, kind of we have these two potential outcomes, we're going to be interested in estimating the average effect for the, the treated. We could look at other, other effects, but uh, again, for expository purposes, it's much easier to focus on the average effect for the treated. And so given that we see the outcome for the treated uh, unit time period pair having been treated, what we need to do is just impute kind of the single missing uh, value here, the single question mark in the Y0 matrix, uh, given all these other uh, data. We may also have other characteristics, other covariates. I'm going to abstract from their presence as well, because it doesn't change the, the conceptual insights that I want to talk about here. So the statistical problem is going to be imputing this question mark given all these other uh, uh, observed values of y0. I'm not going to use y1 directly to do that imputation. Uh, uh, I'm just going to use the observed y for that particular unit to estimate the average effect, but it's all about imputing this missing value given these the other observations on, uh, on y0. And so to think about that problem, one standard case, actually, let me go back for a moment. The, uh, one standard case is, is to assume unconfoundedness type uh, methods where we take as the unit of observation, the rows in this matrix, we take as the outcome the last the period in which the, the unit was treated. So if that's the last period, we take this column of values as the outcome, and we estimate a predictive model using this as the outcome and using the, the previous years as the predictors. Um, and so that goes by many different uh, terms, unconfoundedness, ignorability, conditional dependence assumption, you, uh, you can use a backdoor criterion. We're trying to predict the value, the values in the treated period using the units that are not treated in that period and, uh, and uh, their outcomes from previous periods. We then impute the missing value for the treated unit using that estimated uh, model. And if we use a very simple model, if we just use a linear regression model that amounts to doing a regression, on the control units of the outcome in the treated period on all the lagged outcomes, and then using that to predict the missing value for the, for the treated unit. And what I want to stress here is if you do that in the regression setting, of course, the, in the modern literature, people use uh, much more sophisticated uh, uh, double robust methods. Uh, but if you do this in a regression setting, you would be running a regression with the NC observations, the number of control units, in this case, N minus one, and it would be T regressors in that uh, regression function. The, the number of, uh, of pretreatment pairs, T minus one, plus this, uh, this intercept. And so that's, um, that's all good. But there's another way you could do this which is essentially flipping the role of the columns and the rows in that matrix. And that's, that it, uh, corresponds to the synthetic control estimator. Uh, so there we're going to estimate the treatment effect by taking the outcome for the treated uh, unit time period. And we're going to subtract a weighted uh, combination, a convex combination of the outcomes for the other units where we uh, choose the weights so that in all other periods, the outcome for the treated unit in that period corresponds to the weighted average of the outcomes for the, the control units. And so you can imagine that if you had enough units, if you had enough control units, you would just pick one control unit or a couple of control units that look exactly like the treated unit in the pre-treatment periods. 
but that's kind of difficult if if t is relatively large so we have a lot of periods that we're trying to match and the number of control units is relatively small and so in these settings where both n and t are the same magnitude it's going to be very hard to find a unit that looks exactly like the treated unit so think about the German reunification case. If we look at the time path of GDP, it's going to be hard to find a country that looks exactly like Germany for the last 40 years or so in terms of per capita GDP. So what, what the, the Abadi and co-authors said is, well, instead of looking for a, a single uh, unit, let's look for a artificial synthetic kind of Frankenstein type uh, version of Germany that is just a combination of these other countries. That's a little bit of the Netherlands, that's a little bit of Austria, a little bit of Japan, a little bit of the UK, so that that combination matches the Germany well. And obviously that gives you a lot more degrees of freedom. And so you're going to, in principle, do much better in terms of finding a good uh, combination. The question is exactly how do you implement choosing those weights? And this is kind of why I, I first started with the anchor found in this case. You can write the, the characterization of the weights that the Abadie Diamond Heimler use as a solution to a regression problem, where now instead of regressing the outcomes using instead of using the control units. The, to estimate the regression where the outcome is the last period outcome and the regressors are the previous periods outcomes. Here we do a regression where the time periods are the units of observation and the outcome for the treated unit in those periods is the outcome and the outcomes for the other, for the control units in the same periods are the regressors. So, back to the, the to the matrix y now we use as the unit of observation all of these time periods and the outcome is just this last uh, row we run this regression now with uh, t minus one the uh, unit observations and with uh, n minus one regressors and then the, in the, the original the Abadi Diamond Heimler paper, they impose a couple of restrictions on these coefficients. They don't just do this least squares regression there. They insist, they impose the restriction that all these weights are non-negative. So you use a convex combination rather than any linear combination. And that's going to help, that plays a, a couple of different roles. It's, it's kind of a very clever restriction because and it, it plays the role of regularizing these estimates. Uh, so instead of getting these uh, very wild weights, you're restricting them all to be between zero and one. And so that's going to uh, ensure that they don't get too large. They also impose the restriction that uh, the sum of the weights is equal to one. So it's, it is just strictly a convex combination with weights summing to one. And so that regularizes things. It also leads to uh, estimates where most of the weights typically are equal to zero and there's only a couple of weights that are po that are strictly positive so you, in, uh, if you're trying to impute to construct this synthetic version of germany and you start with uh, 40 potential uh, control countries you don't give positive weight to all of them you end up with positive weights for just a couple of different uh, countries and so you can actually look at those and you can kind of see if it makes sense that uh, which countries you end up with. And in, in that particular case, for example, they end up with positive weight on Austria, uh, Switzerland, the Netherlands, countries which you make a lot of sense from, the pers from a substantive perspective if you're trying to uh, impute what, what's happening in, uh, in Germany. But what I, what I want to stress here is, is that this, uh, synthetic control regression or approach relative to this ignorability or unconfoundedness approach exploits a very different pattern in the data. 
the unconfoundedness approach says we're thinking that there is a stable relationship between Germany and these other countries, a relationship that's stable over time. The unconfoundedness regression says that there's a stable relationship between the outcomes in the last period and the earlier outcomes, a relationship that is stable across all countries, that is the same in Germany as it is in Switzerland and Austria and whatever. And so these are, they're exploiting very different patterns in the, in the data. I kind of be very used to thinking of having a large number of units and assuming that these units somehow are exchangeable. And confoundedness methods don't treat these units as exchangeable. They say, well, the California and New Mexico are more similar over time in every time period than say California and Delaware or California and Florida. And so it looks at different uh, structures in the, in the data. Now, the, this is actually not the way Abadi Diamond Heimler originally wrote their, their estimator, but in the case, because they actually immediately incorporated the presence of other covariates, but it's, it's useful to write it this way because it, it kind of suggests that you could actually generalize that regression by allowing for an intercept in that, uh, that regression. And so estimating the model with an intercept in there and making it a little bit more flexible, um, but still imposing the restrictions that the uh, weight sum to zero, uh, non-negative and sum to, uh, to one. Now, I'm gonna kind of look at these estimators as well as the difference in means estimator, um, not kind of under model-based assumptions, but under assumptions on the assignment uh, mechanism. And in order to do that, exploiting the fact that it's just a single treated unit and a single treated period, I'm going to write the matrix uh, W in terms of as the outer product of two factors, uh, U and V, where U is the N factor of unit assignments. I pick a unit to be treated and V is the T factor of time assignments, where I pick a particular time period to uh, be uh, subject to the, to the treatment. And so the estimate I'm going to focus on most is just the average for the treated. So I, I just pick the only the treated unit and the treated time period and look at y, one minus y zero there. So even though this is written as a sum, in the end, it's just the treatment effect for the, a single the unit uh, time period pair. You could also imagine looking at other targets. You could look at the overall average effect or you could look at the average effect for all n units in the treated time period, tau the superscript v, or you could look at the average effect for the treated units over all t periods, uh, tau the superscript h. They're all going to have sort of, the choice of estimate here is going to matter a lot. All of these, is, these last three are going to be harder to estimate than this first one. So we're focusing initially on, uh, on this particular target, but the choice of the target here matters. And you could well imagine that substantively, you're more interested in tau with superscript V, the average over all units, but that's going to be much harder if there's heterogeneity in the, in the treatment effects. If, uh, and in, in, other, in many cases, it's not really clear why that would be an interesting uh, thing. In the German reunification example, we're interested in the effect on Germany. It's not really clear what it means for the Netherlands or other countries to be um, to be treated there. And so I want to look at two assumptions here on that assignment mechanism. One is that I randomly picked which unit was going to be treated. And second assumption is I randomly picked which time period was going to be treated. Neither of these assumptions is, is necessarily uh, in line with the way synthetic uh, control methods were originally uh, 
introduced because it was very much for observational studies. But I want to look at what the properties are of these methods if, in fact, we, uh, we make these assumptions. In particular, the second assumption is, is very unrealistic because it's almost always the last period or the last few periods that units are treated rather than, than periods in the middle. At the same time, I think it's a very important assumption to consider because a lot of the, the attractive properties from synthetic control estimators come from the fact that the treated period in some way is like the other treat, like the other periods. We're assuming that there is this stable relationship between units in the treat, it's a stable relationship that is the same in the treated period as it is in the other periods. And one way to formalize that is to say, well, the treated period was just randomly drawn from this, uh, from all possible periods. And that makes it at least an expectation, the relationship there is the same as it is in, uh, in other uh, time periods. Now, kind of here, here are a couple of, of very simple estimators, uh, not synthetic control estimators yet. We could look at just the difference in means. We could look at the average uh, using only the, the outcomes in the treated period. So we could average, we could, uh, so the first estimator, we take the treated uh, outcome for the treated unit time period pair, and we subtract the average of all the other uh, pairs. In the second one, we only estimate the outcomes for the control units in the treated period. We could, in the third estimator, we could take the average of the for the treated unit in the other periods, or we could do this um, two-way fixed effect, the difference in difference estimator. Uh, and we can look at, I'm going to look at these, the properties of these estimators under the, the two assumptions. Uh, and so in general, the difference, the simple difference in means estimator is uh, unbiased for the, the population estimator only if we have both unit and time randomization. The difference in difference estimator though is uh, does much better. It's unbiased for the the for tau itself. And, um, even if we have only unit randomization or only time randomization or both. Uh, okay, so now let me kind of introduce a more general class of, uh, of synthetic control estimators. And what I want to do here is think about what the synthetic control estimator is going to be like, um, depending on which unit is selected for the treatment and which time period is selected for the, for the treatment. And so I'm going to characterize that estimator in terms of this uh, uh, these weights M that I indexed uh, by I in general by I, J, and T, where I is the unit that gets treated, T is the time period that gets uh, uh, that is treated, and J is the the weight the way so the J indexes the unit that gets uh, that gets the weight. So I'm going to estimate the average effect as a linear combination of outcomes uh, yjt, where the, the t is the treated period and j, the j runs for, there's an index that runs over all units when the unit i is the treated unit. So m, say m1, 2, 5 is the weight that unit 5 gets uh, if the treated period is period five and the treated unit is uh, unit one. And so the, we're going to choose these weights in order to maximize, to uh, minimize some objective function that is based on the, on all periods other than the, the treated period. And so, and so that's kind of in line with the synthetic control estimator 
but allows us to consider a more general class of, um, of estimators. There's two restrictions we always impose, kind of the weight for the unit that's being treated is always uh, equal to one. The weight for all the other units is uh, non-negative and it's going to, uh, to, sum to, uh, uh, sum to one. Then within that, the general characterization of, uh, of this class of synthetic control estimators, the original Abadi Diamond Heimuller synthetic control estimator imposes two more restrictions. One that the intercept there is zero, and second that the sum of the weights for the control units uh, is equal to minus one, which means that the sum of, given that the weight for the treaty unit is equal to one, it means that the sum of the other weights, uh, the total sum of the weights is equal to zero. So all I've done so far is give a much more uh, complicated way of characterizing the synthetic control estimator, but doing it in a way that allows us to look at the bias and the uh, properties of uh, both this estimator and, uh, uh, and other estimators. And so the modification that I talked about before was that we allow the intercept to be uh, different from zero. But I want to introduce uh, one more modification in addition to having the weights over all control units sum to zero. Also, when I have the weights over all the uh, donor, uh, over all treated units sum to zero. And what, I, what that is doing is saying that in the standard uh, synthetic control estimator, it may be the case that some, unit get, some units get used as a control much more than other units. So if, the, so let's kind of think of the units being the 50 states in the US, let's kind of think of the, the matching essentially based on the proximity. And maybe that Kansas gets used as a match both for states on the East Coast and for states on the West Coast. So it may get used as a match much more than say Alaska, which is way outside. Uh, and sort of Alaska is never really a very good match for any other state. And that's kind of that's cre that creates a problem. That creates a bias because Alaska doesn't get used as a control as often as it gets used as a treated unit in the randomization. And so what this restriction is going to do is say, well. If you have a randomization distribution, where there's a one in 50 chance that Alaska gets used as a treated unit, we also need to have it used as a control one in 50 times. We can't have a unit that is possibly a treated unit that doesn't ever get used as a control. And that's what this restriction uh, imposes. And by including this restriction, we get rid of the bias of the, the synthetic control estimator. And then the estimator we actually uh, favor the most is one where we get rid of the intercept and we impose that restriction that gets rid of the bias. And now here, in some sense, kind of is, the, is a key result. Uh, if we look at the synthetic control estimator that turns out to be biased even if we have unit randomization. It's also biased in general, if we randomly pick the time period that uh, the, the, the unit is treated. It's in fact, it's still biased if both the unit is chosen at random and the time period is chosen at random, even if there's many time periods. This unbiased estimator, on the other hand, so this modified unbiased estimator is unbiased if we have unit randomization. It's also unbiased if we have just time randomization, but there's many time periods. And it's unbiased if, uh, if we have both unit and time randomization or both unit and time randomization and large, a large number of time periods. The only case where it's not exactly uh, unbiased 
is if we only have the time randomization and we have a small number of time periods. But, and kind of from the other case, you can see what the allowing for the intercept moving to the modified synthetic control estimator buys you unbiasedness under time randomization with a large number of time periods and imposing the additional restriction gets you unbiasedness just under unit randomization and the modified unbiased synthetic control estimator has both of these properties so it's it's unbiased in all the cases where one of the other estimators is unbiased you can kind of see you can characterize the bias directly there and see that it depends kind of on these uh, these weights and the restriction we're imposing here is that this this set of weights uh, is equal to uh, to zero and so that gets rid of the of the bias now given the randomization distribution we can characterize the exact variance of uh, of this of the estimator and so the, the, the expression for the variance isn't all that interesting but it turns out you can actually estimate that as well you can get an unbiased estimator for that uh, that variance it's unbiased for finite and finite uh, t it's kind of a very messy thing there because it it involves a bunch of uh, of bias corrections uh, but if if you actually use the weights corresponding to the difference in means estimator where all the weights are one over n minus one then you get back to the standard variance estimator so it kind of does have some intuition that this is actually the natural estimator but the problem is there is no guarantee that it's non-negative uh, and so in principle in very small and small t cases you could end up with a variance estimator that is negative which is not so so great now let me um kind of end with some uh, some simulations here for this the uh, for these estimators so here we we went back to this uh, state year uh, data so we have data for 40 years for 50 states we looked at a couple of different uh, outcomes and we did these placebo experiments to see how well these estimators did in terms of uh, root mean squared error relative to the, the difference in means uh, estimator. And so we see that uh, kind of both for log wages, uh, we do substantially better. For hours, we do, no, the improvement is not quite as big, but it's still substantial. And similarly for unemployment rates, we, uh, we do, uh, considerably better than the than the difference in uh, in means the variance estimator uh, does uh, does very well we we end up uh, uh, getting very close to the uh, the variance of the estimator across the the simulations so let me uh, then uh, wrap things up uh, here so what, uh, what we set out to do is kind of understand whether the synthetic control estimator had a role to play if we actually had a randomized experiment. And it turns out that these estimators can be very useful there. They can do much better than the difference in means estimator in terms of, uh, of root mean squared error. But the standard version of that does come with some problems that there could be a bias. Uh, and so it doesn't come with the guarantees that the simple estimators, uh, the difference in means estimator comes with. And so uh, we figured out a way of uh, getting rid of that, uh, that bias. And now we have an estimator that just like the difference in means is uh, always going to be unbiased under randomization but that, uh, unlike, that has a much better root mean squared error than the, the difference in means. And so whenever you're doing experiments with very few treated units, so that you may not have enough uh, data to get uh, good comparisons for the, the treated units, uh, using the synthetic control estimator 
is likely to give you much uh, more precise estimates of the of the treatment effect uh, there.